E.T.E. Emhotep, Shani Shanet, Uncle Josh Shanet, Uncle Asta Jed, Dua, 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 Henu for listening. Uh, it's your brother, Shaw M. Cobb. We in the building once again. Y'all know what we about to do today. Y'all know. <laughs> as soon as you seen the link, you knew exactly what we were about to do today. Um, Today, we're going to continue on with the slave trade Uh discussion talking about the east african uh participation in it so that you can see how east africans come to the united states so you can get over terms or not even terms uh the new colloquial usage of we're only west african um because that discounts south africa north africa East Africa, uh, people start to make claims like, you ain't no Egyptian, you ain't no Egyptian. Number one, you shouldn't have tried to tie that in, but because they did, now we have to discuss how parts of that area, especially uh, the Nilo Saharans, uh, get to the Americas in a lot of cases. And so this is what that particular show is going to be about uh, today. And I really wanted to do this uh, not because of my man Rob Bourne or Garfield. Um, I heard somebody just yesterday. I hope it wasn't you, J. Will. I hope it wasn't you. Talking about, oh, we need to worry more about the veterans more than what happened in slavery, blah, 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 blah. Listen, don't you ever disrespect the ancestors' plight. And don't put the two in the same sentence such as slavery veterans they don't even coagulate together okay they don't even coagulate together and if we were to go back and talk about what happened to the african-american veterans such as a muhammad ali or to the uh particular uh africans who represented the united states in those wars Vietnam in particular, since you mentioned that one, uh, 
What happened to their pension when they came home? What happened to their job placement when they came home? They were being discriminated against still. So if you're going to do something for the veterans, don't try to dissolve it from slavery because the treatment was similar when they came home. It was similar when they came home. Don't ever try to hide in the shadows of uh, uh, veterans to, di to, to disrespect what happened in the African Holocaust. I go in your mouth. They crazy. They crazy. Let's look who's in the chat before we start sharing the screen. What up, Vice and Nicole Gullah's in the building. I see two others in the building, of course. Let's start to present, man. This information is not really refutable. Um, My brother, Rob Bourne, you don't have to respond to this. You can sit back because I already know. <laughs> you family, but sometimes... You, there's nothing to say concerning this you know there's nothing to say so last epi episode we talked about the atlantic slave trade and we started to see some of the participants we noticed uh some migrations in africa um we noticed a few other things today i'm going to do something that they couldn't seem to do a lot of the brothers can't seem to do which is I'm going to find a slave ship and its remains. Then we're going to tell you where that slave ship is from, <laughs> which will be another shocker, of course. Um, also today, we're going to, uh, we're going to, we're going to tie e this East Africa thing together. We're going to show what happened. And we only need a few articles to do it. And we're also going to go to a book. I haven't even gotten into the books to start showing uh, the, the religions and the spirituality that came over here. I don't think we'll do that. We don't really need to. I didn't pull up drums and shadows where you get eyewitness accounts. Oh, baby, there's a shadow in that. There's a shadow in that. There's a fixer over there. There's so-and-so over there. You know, there's spirits in it. We, we didn't get into all of that. We don't need to. The book is called Drums and Shadows. I've read it several times on the internet in these types of discussions. And you really don't want to get into the accounts in there because it's really damning to anyone who would say otherwise. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Let's get busy. We'll start. Where should we start? We, we were here. Remember, we were here. We talked about this. This is transatlantic stuff. Then I believe we went to the trans-Saharan slave trade, right? During the trans-Saharan slave trade, slaves were transported across the Sahara Desert. Most were moved from sub-Saharan Africa to North Africa to be sold to Mediterranean and Middle Eastern civilizations. Pan-African James, if you're in the building, <coughs> I'm going to give you some more of the links in here. Some of the uh, the primaries, because I, th I think you was asking for some primaries on one of these. Uh, so today I'm going to give you a whole slave ship, my brother. You'll see exactly where it comes from, family. Um Estimates of the total number of black slaves moved from sub-Saharan Africa to the Muslim world range from 11 to 17 million. And the trans-Saharan trade routes conveyed a significant number of this total, with one estimate tallying around 7.2 million slaves crossing the Sahara from the mid-7th century until the 20th century. That's way back here in early Egyptian times, man. Look, records of slave trading and transportation in the Sahara date back as the third millennium BC. King Seneferu, who crossed the fourth cataract of the Nile into what is today modern Sudan to capture slaves and send them north. These raids for prisoners of war who subsequently became slaves were a regular occurrence in the ancient Nile Valley in Africa during times of conquest and after winning battles the ancient Nubians were taken as slaves by the ancient Egyptians now they kind of blow that up a little bit they blow that up a bit with that particular 
thing there because we have the records of what happened with that right when he went to go get a nubian he had other nubians help him go get the nubian <laughs> because he was considered to be a traitor to to egypt etc etc and to nubia let's keep going uh the garmentes relied heavily on slave labor from sub-saharan africa they used slaves in their own communities to construct and maintain underground irrigation system known to berbers as fogata ancient greek historians herodotus record this in the fifth century bc and the garmentes enslaved cave dwelling ethiopians known as troglodytes let's go down further bantus what in the early roman empire the city lepsis established the slave market to buy and sell slaves from the bantu african interior so when guys tell you stuff about dna or anything or blah 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 and they, there was no bantu there, there was no bantu bantus are there that'll lead us to another topic later on debunking you but bantu africans are there when I tell you Maasai people are there, Khoisan people are there, they're there. Who do you think makes up ancient Egypt and Africa? Nahesi, Maasai, Somali. There's a whole Maasai-Somali war that takes place. So people, are they, they don't really understand the dynamic that happened in ancient Egypt. And any historian who wants to debate it because i've got primaries come see me come see me we can talk about the clans who were actually there anyway let's go further black slaves seem to have been valued as household slaves for their exotic appearance some historians argue that the scale of slave trade in this period may have been higher the mid mid medieval times due to the high demand for slaves in the roman empire however the slave trade through the sahara in antiquity may have been small and rare as saharan trade didn't reach large uh dimensions until the arabs and berbers introduced large numbers of camels into the desert so camels were introduced to africa as we have to tell people on occasion anyway let's look at some of these slave trade routes middle ages all up cairo this is egypt right here where my cursor is and somehow now look at the look at this central africa west africa but they act like this is so difficult to do they were doing it then before we got over here they were already doing it then look at this tunisia algeria mogadishu down here down south their way down here greater zimbabwe empire of Kitara, kilwa zanzibar we already covered zanzibar and mozambique were the huge hubs for slave trading and ship docking to go around the route over here remember we looked at the routes let's read a little more because this we're not even going to cover all this article here we just want some of it paul lovejoy estimates that around six million black slaves were transported across the sahara between the years 650 a.d and 1500 a.d the, that that's not even close that now we had 17 million in our 400 uh year situation they had six million over the time of 650 AD to 1500 AD our Holocaust is the worst the worst and this is over a stretched out period of time the six this six million the others happened in a 400 year span that's crazy it's crazy anyway following the early 8th century conquest of north africa arabs berbers and other ethnic groups ventured into south saharan africa get used to saying south saharan first along the nile valley towards nubia 
and across the Sahara towards West Africa. They were interested in the trans-Saharan trade. Especially in slaves as there was a constant demand for slaves in the Eastern Arab nations and Constantinople. The Muslim slave traders distinguished themselves from the people on the other side of the Sahara, referring to these African populations as Zanj, or Sudan, meaning black. Zanj. So if you ever hear an Arab call you a Zanj, <laughs> you know what he's saying. Arabs would routinely acquire slaves through violent raiding followed by capturing them and sending them on dangerous forced marches across the Sahara to slave markets where they would be treated as chattel, personal property that can be brought and sold. In North Africa, the main slave markets were in Morocco, Algiers, Tripoli, and Cairo. Sales were held in public places such as souks. Aside from raiding, slaves could also be obtained by purchasing them from local black rulers the 9th century arab historian yakubi states they the arabs export black slaves belonging to the mira zagua marua and other black races who are near to them and whom they capture i hear that the black kings sell blacks without pretext and without war Oof. Mm -mm -mm. zanj Berber explorer Ibn Battuta said, look, African kingdom of Mali. Everybody knows the Mali Holocaust. Ghana, Tripoli. Let's go down further. Let's go down further before we hop to the next article. In some instances, look at that, 30,000 black slaves to perform all difficult labor. Labor. Some black slaves served in the military forces in North Africa, for example, the Zira dynasty. All up top. Umayyads of Cordoba, all up in Europe. This is when they were taking Europeans and enslaving some of them as well in the Arab world and in Africa. Anyway, we won't get to that right now. Uh-oh, hold up. I got a phone call. That's my brother, Ratty. We tell him, brother, Rat. I'm doing the show. I'm going to hit you in just a few. Peace. All right, let's keep going. In the Muslim culture of the Middle Ages, blackness became increasingly identified with slavery. This was justified by appeals to a specific interpretation of the biblical story of the curse of Ham that posited Ham had been cursed by Noah in two ways. The first, the turning of his skin black, and the second, that his descendants would be doomed to slavery. Muslim slave traders would use this as a pretext to enslave blacks, including black Muslims. Okay? Okay. Y'all heard that, right? I'm not going to read it again. In the late 14th century, a black king of Bornu wrote a letter to the Sultan of Egypt complaining of the continual slave raids perpetrated by Arab tribesmen, which were devastating his lands and resulting in the mass enslavement of the black Muslim population of the region. This is when the, the Arabs had taken over Egypt. In Al-Andalus, the area of medieval Iberia, under Islamic control, black Muslims could be legally held as slaves. This all occurred despite the orthodox Muslim jurist's position that no Muslim, regardless of race, could be enslaved. Unless you were black. <laughs> 19th century engraving depicting a, a caravan transporting black African slaves across the Sahara. Look at this. Look at this. Let's get a close-up. You all see that? All shackled with the wooden bonds. Look at this. It's your Muslim cousin. So I say there's certain things we have to discuss. Arab, my Arab brothers. 
certain things we have to discuss in our future. Arabs were sometimes made into slaves in the Trans-Saharan slave trade. Sometimes castration was done on Arab slaves. In Mecca, Arab women were sold as slaves according to Ibn, but we don't even need to read that. We know that. That could happen to you today. Anyway, let's get here. In Central Africa, during the 16th to 17th centuries, slave traders continued to raid the region as part of the expansion of the Saharan and Nile River slave routes. It estimated that in the 17th and 18th centuries, 1.4 million slaves were compelled to make the trek through the Sahara. Captives were enslaved and shipped to the Mediterranean coast, Europe, Arabia, and the Western Hemisphere to the slave ports and factories along the West and North Africa coast or south along Ubanqui and Congo rivers. So here, 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, now we're talking about our Holocaust. We're being shipped to the Western Hemisphere. We are going through a Central African route. We are East and Western Africans being trafficked. If you doubt it now, you'll check yourself by the time I'm done with this video. I'm telling you right now. Let's see who that. Let's see if any protractors popped up. What up, Dasha Ab? Japanese junk ships. Both of these events took place right before the migration of Western Hemisphere. Oh, look at Vice of dropping knowledge in the in the chat. Kilowab was Portuguese learned to advance cotton. So yeah, but the biggest thing was sugar, and we haven't covered. We we touched on the sugar. Sugar is what got it popping, and you'll see that in when we get to Europe. We'll get there in a second. I see five of you all in the mix. 1.2 million slaves are estimated to have been sent through the Sahara in the 19th century in the 1830s, a period when the slave trade flourished. Gadamus was handling 2,500 slaves a year. Even though the slave trade was officially abolished in Tripoli in 1853. So even though slavery was over, East Africa was still doing it. When Europe was putting pressure on the West, West Africa, to stop, and Muslim countries as well, to stop, East Africa was still doing it. If you doubt, Like I said, if you doubt it now, by the time we finish, you won't doubt it then. <laughs> Even though the slave trade was officially abolished. One witness to the behavior of the slave dealers, G.F. Leon, described their behavior in Libya thusly. Let's see what he says. None of the owners were ever without their whips, which were in constant use. No slave dares to be ill, couldn't get sick, or unable to walk, he couldn't be tired. But when the poor sufferer dies, the master suspects there must have been something wrong inside of him and regrets not having liberally applied the usual remedy of burning the belly with a red-hot iron, thus recounseling to themselves their cruel treatment of these unfortunate creatures, you unfortunate creature, you black soul, you. Now, Englishman William George Brown rolled with the Darb Al Arbayan caravan in the 1790s. It delivered slaves, male and females, to Egypt. It delivered slaves, male and females, to Egypt. It delivered slaves, male and female, to Egypt. In Tripoli, Leon recorded that from 4,000 to 5,000 slaves were processed annually with slave raids to areas like Kenim, Bornu, providing sources of captives. Other 19th century European explorers also recorded their perilous experience traveling through the deadly Saharan desert alongside, alongside slave caravans. Gustav Natchigal reported finding numerous bones at desert springs that had run dry. 
Nachigal estimated that for every one slave that successfully arrived at the market, three or four had either died or escaped, hopefully escaped. Cold could also kill in the desert as the explorer Heinrich Barth relayed a story that the vizier of Mornu had lost 40 slaves in a single night in Libya. A British account described happening upon an abandoned caravan surrounded by 100 skeletons. God dog, man. Real in the field. 1858, the British Council of Tripoli recorded that more than 60 per 66 percent of the value shipped across the Sahara was made up by slaves. The British consul in Benghazi wrote in 1875 that the slave trade had reached an enormous scale and that the slaves who were sold in Alexandria and Constantinople and Constantinople, Egypt right there, Constantinople, Rome, had quadrupled in price. This trade, he wrote, was encouraged by local government. By the mid-19th century, it's possible that nearly 10,000 slaves were being transported to North Africa nearly. The Muslim historian Ahmad ibn Khalid and Nasiri bemoaned the unlimited enslavement of blacks in the 19th century North Africa. Unlimited enslavement. In the 19th century in North Africa. So forget the 1700s. When it was happening to us. Proverbially. In 1900. It was unlimited. Still. In North Africa. The North. Still secretly supplying the Western Hemisphere. Still secretly supplying Europe. Still secretly supplying India. Still engulfing them into and entrenching them into Arabia. Where men trafficked them like beasts or worse. And where the majority of slaves were Muslims who should have been exempt from slavery because of their religious status. So y'all was hiding behind religious status. And that really only worked in America and Europe. It didn't work in Africa. It worked in America and Europe. Which is why most of them converted. In the first place. To hide And it didn't even work. Look at that. Slave market of Marrakesh as depicted on the cover of La Petite Parisine of June 2nd, 1907. Libya is still trafficking today. Libya is still trafficking today. Now, we're going to get off of this. We're just going to cover this last part because this is not important, really. This is just giving you the precursor. According to Professor Ibrahima Babe Kaki, there were four main slavery routes to North Africa, from east to west of Africa, from Maghreb to the Sudan. Maghreb is West Africa. Sudan is East Africa. Stop lying like they weren't coming over to the west. From Triplotini. Where's that? It's way up north to central Sudan and from Egypt to the Middle East. Caravan trails set up in the 19th in the 9th century went past the oasis of the Sahara. Travel was difficult and uncomfortable for reasons of climate and distance. This has been going on since Roman times. Roman times. What's, what's our routes, though? East to west. East to west on a regular basis. On a regular basis. Went past the oasis of the Sahara. So don't lie. Don't lie. Look, town ports. Morocco. Algeria, Libya, Egypt, 
Maritana, Timbuktu, Mali, Niger, Nigeria. Trans-Sahara Highway. We got routes. Trans-Sahara Trade. We got maps. There's ancient... There's routes. Clearly, Cairo went from Egypt to the West. Clearly. Let's let's dig deeper. We need more evidence than that. You can't just show us that, Asar. We need to get in depth. Let's get in depth. Let's start to go. <laughs> Abdulazizi Laudi. Demetrius Professor of Swahili and African Linguist at the University of, of Uppsala in Sweden. Slavery was part of different African cultures, he states. When it came to exports, tribal Africans themselves were the main actors. In many African societies, there, was, there were no prisons. So people who were captured were sold. Let's go to Zanzibar. Let's go to Zanzibar right here. And, and this is, look. If you didn't know, let me go up. This is what Zanzibar, the slave trade flourished in Zanzibar. Arab Muslims sought slaves for the Middle East or to work on clove farms. You look like a good slave. That's probably what he's saying right there. This cat running, he probably going to put hands on somebody or get out of Dodge. Let's go. The slave trade in East Africa really took off from the 17th century. More and more merchants from Oman settled in Zanzibar. The island took on an even more important role in the international trade of goods due to the large trade at the Swahili coast and consequently also in the slave trade. This is how the largest slave market in East Africa was created. So this is how it was done. Only estimates, some of which very widely exist as of how many Africans were sold from East to North Africa. This is also due to the fact that many of the slaves perished. Scientific researchers conclude that about three out of four slaves died before they reached the market where they were to be sold. The causes were hunger, illness, exhaustion after long journeys. And so we just read that in that other article. They're saying East to North Africa right there we haven't gotten to our side in this article we did it in the other we're going to do it on a few articles Arthur India estimates that 17 million East Africans were sold into slavery most people still have the so-called transatlantic slave trade by Europeans into the new world in mind but in reality the Arab Muslim slavery was much greater, India said. Eight million Africans were bought from East Africa via the Trans-Saharan route to Morocco or Egypt. A further nine million were deported to regions on the Red Sea or the Indian Ocean. The spice of slavery, historian Lodi disagrees with India about the figures. He's saying that they're less than 17 million, whatever. He said 11 million. Still a travesty. Old reports were also methodically doubtful. For example, David Livingston, a Scottish missionary and explorer, estimated that 50,000 slaves were being sold annually in the markets of Zanzibar. Even today, the number of people living in Zanzibar is not close to 50,000. The numbers have neither hand nor foot, Lodi said. Not all slaves were taken to Egypt or Saudi Arabia. From 1820, the Omani settlers began cultivating cloves in Zanzibar to meet the growing demand of the world market. So now, we're not just going to the Arab world anymore. Remember, slavery was abolished. 1785 is the claim. We know it continued illegally. Afterwards, up to the 19th century. Let's go. Zanzibar to meet growing demand on the world market. Large plantations quickly developed and slaves caught be bought cheaply at the nearby slave market. 
From 1839 to 1860, the quantity of exported cloves increased from 565 to 1,246 pounds to 12,600 kilograms, according to American history Frederick Cooper. Zanzibar's reputation changed from being the center of the slave trade to a center of slave keeping, which produced notorious figures such as the legendary slave trader Tipu Tip. The end of slavery. Here's, here's that date. At the end of August 1791, a slave revolt began in today's IAT and the Dominican Republic. Why are we talking about them? We're talking about East African slavery. Why are we talking about Haiti and the Dominican Republic if we're talking about East African slavery? Let's go. These two uprisings significantly promoted the out uh, the uh, the the abolishment basically abolition of the transatlantic slave trade slavery and colonialism in africa however it was not until 1873 that sultan saeed baragash of zanzibar under pressure from great britain signed a treaty 18 that's almost 100 years after it's almost 100, 1791 is when they say it ended 1873 is when they pressured Bargash of Zanzibar to knock it off. He signed a treaty that made that slave trade in his territories illegal. That decree was still not enforced effectively. This puts it over 100 years. Until 1909, slavery was finally abolished in East Africa. Finally. According to author Ndi, uh, India, slavery still exists, albeit in a different form. It estimated that nearly 40 million people worldwide still live in slavery. In Africa, there are hundreds of thousands. In Mauritania, they say they have abolished slavery. But in reality, the situation in North Africa has not changed much. Young people are enslaved against their will, forced to work and sexually exploited. But well, right up here, this says, IAT in the Dominican Republic. Mm -mm -mm. There, there have been reports from Libya about organized slave markets. And a few years ago, a case of slavery was uncovered in Tanzania. And we know about that. A mine was found in a remote area where 50 to 60 boys were forced to work. They were not paid and lived in a camp guarded by armed men. The effects of slavery in East Africa are not as severe as the economic consequences of Western colonization of Africa. So the colonization of West Africa has divided Africa into portions. And we talk about this all the time. Where are the resources? You used to be the resource. Now they want the land. Now they want the land. Because you willingly work for them now. It's no problem. You'll apply at their companies and all of that. Right? We do it all the time. You're forced to. I got to do it too. <laughs> the economy of many of these countries is still dominated by the West. It's a topic being discussed by many intellectuals. But India says that what happened in East Africa over the centuries should also be openly discussed. Before we get off of this and start to get into the meat and gumbo of this thing. Most of the African authors have not yet published the book on the Arab Muslim slave trade out of religious solidarity. There are 500 million Muslims in Africa and it's better to blame the West than talk about the past crimes of Arab Muslims. And so, <laughs> as stated, as stated, you can see there's involvement. Ooh, should we get into that slave ship? Let's go here first. Let's go here because, and this is a book you probably, Black Mother, Years of the African Slave Trade. I just want to borrow it. Let me get in here. I don't need no print. I don't need no printout. <laughs> 
I just want to borrow it. Let me borrow it for an hour. Thank you, thank you. Let's go. This this is David Basil. David Basil put out an excellent movie covering how Africans have been marginalized, showing your ancestors in Egypt, etc. But let's go, let's go further. You go in this book here. This is called Black Mother. For the trade began the old states of Africa, slaves and slaving, the years of trial and then a flood. How many systems? He covers it all. Root of the evil, Congo, and Angola, Matamba, law and order, riddle of Kilawa. When you pipe at Zanzibar, when you pipe. Page 191. That's page 311. Let's go to 191. When you pipe at Zanzibar. I bet you we can find some stuff. In Zanzibar. <laughs> I bet you we're going to find some goodies in Zanzibar. Let's see what they say. In Zanzibar. Let's see what's up. When you pipe at Zanzibar, let me scoop this over. Let me get it comfortable in here. Yeah, let's blow it up. Here we go. But European slaving, slaving from the East Coast was not the end of the story. Some of the seaboard cities were also in business. One or two of them were making considerable profits from it. And none more than Zanzibar. By now, a dependency of the imam of the southern Arabian state of Muscat, one British naval visitor, Captain Smee, found in 1811. The governor of Zanzibar, an Arab called Yakut, was taking $10 a head in premium. You know how much $10 would have been back then? This dude is bawling out. From every slave delivered to the French from their plantations on Mauritius and Bourbon, as well as selling the French Yakut. Let's turn the page. Let's see what's up. Let's go to the top. Let's see what's up. Scoot over some. Let me center it for y'all. There you go. Was also supplying Muscat and other Eastern markets, perhaps to a total of between six and 10,000 slaves a year. Such exports, even so, were still on a relatively small scale in the West. Brazil was taking more than five times as many. However, evil the plight of the enslaved, East Coast peoples would not have suffered greatly from slaving and nor would their neighbors in the interior. But the Arabs of Oman and Muscat were thrusting merchants who now pushed inland from the coast and mightily expanded the slave trade. Goodness. By 1839, when Zanzibar had the lion's share of slaving, a British observer reckoned that between 40 and 45,000 slaves were being sold there every year. About half of these went northward to Arabia, the Persian Gulf, and Egypt. Hmm. Most of the rest were smuggled southward to Portuguese in Mozambique, who sent them to Brazil. American slave ships also drew cargoes from the source. Anybody telling you I said, anybody telling you East Africans didn't make it to the Americas is full of, they need to use the bathroom. They need to use the bathroom. I believe David Basil before I believe you, any of you. Because you know David Basil go get it right. David Basil is in Africa. We got David Basil videotape up in here. Don't play. Don't play. He gives more credence than some of you, you, you new jacks at this. Who don't study often enough. 
He said most of the rest were smuggled southward to the Portuguese in Mozambique. Wait, 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 wait. When Zanzibar had the lion's share of slaving, talking about East Africa, man. About half of these went northward to Arabia, the Persian Gulf, and Egypt. Most of the rest were smuggled southward to Portuguese in Mozambique, who sent them to Brazil. American slave ships also drew cargoes from this source. Shh. It's done. I, I, we can close the book now if, if we wanted to. But he's talking about more stuff. I want to see what else is going on. After 1840, the business of extracting slaves from East Africa became a major Arab enterprise. In that year, the Sultan of Oman, he keeps popping up, doesn't he, transferred his capital from Muscat to his dependency on Zanzibar. A man of great commercial talent, he said about reorganizing the trade of Zanzibar and of much of the coast on an entirely new basis. He stimulated exports of natural products from the mainland. He established clove plantations on Zanzibar. He sent envoys far and wide across the eastern world to win new markets or reactivate old ones. Arab merchants were again installed as in early medieval times at ports as far as away as southern coast of China. He was a major effort to rebuild the former prosperity of of the Indian Ocean trade between East Africa and its old partners. But now there was a difference. Slaving had become a major part of the business, even a dominant part of it. The years before and after 1840, but especially after, were those of far-reaching Arab penetration of the East African interior. The Arabs and their Swahili agents went in along the old... Let's go up top here. Let's see. Trade routes. From Bagamoya, Kilwa, Tanga, and rapidly established trading stations on the Great Lakes and at suitable places in between. Armed with musk, they got guns now. They overawed the weak and skillfully allied themselves with the strong. They pushed even further into the interior. It will be seen the British explorer spec could write in 1864 that the Zanzibar Arabs have reached the uttermost limits of their tether. They are halfway across the continent and in a few years they must unite their laborers with the people who come from Luanda on the opposite coast. Look at this. Look at this. disgusting let's turn the page i'm gonna i'm gonna let me back it up so we can we can see if we can see something really important other than what we already uncovered really quickly and that didn't even take long <laughs> arab slave trade british and belgians Subjugation, East Africa, where others have traded and had never flourished. There's more about, they, they're talking about trading with Europe. And of course, this is how Europe has so many Somalis in uh, their area. We'll cover that in a second as well. But they also came to the Americas. They also came to the Americas. And, uh, uh, you know, yeah, and that's the end of that chapter pretty much. Let's go here. Let's, let's, let's get some physical evidence. That's a haplo group. We, we won't even get into the haplo group. Let's see if we've got a boat. I'm talking all this, yeah, let's get a boat. Grim history traced in sunken slave ship found off South Africa. 
the Portuguese fort of Sao Lourenço off Mozambique Island. The island was one of the main ports for the slave trade during colonial times. We covered objects from a sunken slave ship, Sao Jose Paque, Africa, including iron ballast blocks and encrusted shackles will go on long-term loan to a museum in Washington. Why are they going to Washington? <laughs> Let me make this bigger for y'all so y'all can read it with me. So y'all can see. You can see. Your history, man. Let's go. December 3rd, 1794. A Portuguese slave ship left Mozambique on the east coast. On the where? The east coast of Africa. For what was to be a 7,000 mile voyage to Moreno, Brazil. And the sugar plantations. Remember, it's always sugar over, over here. It's about that sugar. Sugar plantations that awaited its cargo of black men and women. Shackled in the ship's hold were between four and 500 slaves. Pressed flesh to flesh with their backs on the floor. With the exception of daily breaks to exercise, the slaves were to spend the bulk of the estimated four-month journey from the Indian Ocean across the vast South Atlantic into the dark of the hold. Where are they going? From the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. The South Atlantic, that's where you're going. You're going to the damn Americas. <laughs> you're on your way to America, kid. You're going right down to the Caribbean islands, buddy. Where they going? So don't let nobody, I keep telling you, stop. Tell these characters, stop it. And they don't have a boat. We about to look at a boat. Let's see what we got. The piece of the boat that we got left. The other should be in Washington. In case you guys want to see it. It'll be here in America. In the end. Their journey lasted only 24 days. Buffeted by strong winds. The ship the Sao Jose Paquette. Africa. Rounded the treacherous Cape of Good Hope. And came apart. Violently on two reefs. Not far from Cape Town. Not only 100 yards from the shore. But in deep turbulent water, the Portuguese captain crew and half of the slaves survived. An estimated 212 slaves did not and perished in the sea. Rest to our ancestors. Why do y'all think Killmonger said what he said? They would fight and they would die in the sea. Why you think Killmonger said what he said in Black Panther? This is why. These are the reasons why. On Tuesday, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, along with Ezekiel Museums of South Africa, the Slave Rex Project, and other partners will announce in Cape Town that the remnants of the sale, Jose, have been found right where the ship went down in full view of lion's head mountain it is the first time researchers involved in the project say that the wreckage of a slaving ship that went down with slaves abroad has been recovered this is the information they couldn't provide for you but we got it here on this show debunking you on the heck in the chair channel don't forget to subscribe hit the like button also go to my sarm ka channel if you'd like sometimes i present there as well over there we can be free in here i have to watch my tongue and my mannerisms <laughs> let's go further the story of the sao jose like the slave trade itself spanned continents and oceans from fishing villages in africa to shake thumbs where powerful chiefs plotted with European traders to traffic in human beings to work on plantations in the new world. Fittingly, the discovery of the Sao Jose also encompassed continents and oceans. Drivers from the United States joined divers in South Africa, while museum curators in Africa, Europe, and the Americas poured through old slate old ship manifest looking for clues they needed clues because you just can't see it oh see we found a ship no you need clues 
need to know the who, how, what, and why. In the end, the breakthrough that the shipwreck was of a vessel that had been carrying slaves came from something unexpected. The iron blocks of ballast that were used to offset the weight of slaves in the hold. The more cargo that you have that is living, the more ballast you need because live cargo moves and is not as heavy as, say, tubs of molasses, said Paul Gardulo, historian and curator at the Smithsonian African American Museum. Ballast becomes a signature for slaving and a direct cor corollary, cor corollary to human beings. For the museums set to open on the National Mall in Washington next year, the find represents the culmination of more than a decade of work searching for the remains of a slave ship. Any slave ship that could help tell the story of the 12 million people who were sold into bondage and forcibly moved over some 60,000 voyages from Africa to North America, the West Indies, South America, and Europe. So these are the remains. It's Cape Town, South Africa. Look, Mozambique, East Coast right there. And then they would shoot over there. We already know the history of that port. We already know where most of the, the, the captives, your African brothers and sisters, your grandfathers, your great, great this, your great, great that came from. They made that clear when they hit that Mozambique port. And this is 1794. But we know in the 1800s when they were still doing it, who they were getting, where they were getting them from. They're East African. Lonnie Bunch, the founding director of the museum, had been looking for such a wreck when he took the job in 2005. I really wanted something from a slave ship, he said in an interview. How hard could that be? Let's see. Exceptionally hard, it turned out, because the museum wanted something original to showcase, and ideally a slave ship wreck that was connected to the United States. Visits to maritime museums in Liverpool and Lisbon for leads on slave ships yielded little. Mr. Bunch heard of a ship that had left Bristol, R.I., in the late 1790s, sailed to Ghana to pick up 144 Africans, then sailed across the Atlantic and sank off the coast of Cuba. But trying to find and excavate, that ship proved too complicated, he said, Mr. Gardulo. Gardulo, the museum curator, was also chasing leads that went nowhere. This is how difficult it is to find slave ships now. A lot of them turn into houses, different things of that nature. Let's just skip ahead a little bit. In 2011, as he was pouring through the Western Cape Archives repository, that is part of South African National Archives Network, Mr. Boshoff found a critical document a record from the inquest of the captain of the sail, Jose, describing what happened on December 27, 1794, when the ship went down. Let's see what happened. And you can see Mr. Bischoff, Mr. Boshoff began to dig into the archival records, particularly those relating to the Dutch East India Company. Because India and them were involved in selling you. <laughs> The document, which is Portuguese uh, and paraphrases the inquest testimony of Captain Manuel Zhao, is chilling. The ship had hugged the shoreline to protect itself from strong winds, but was so close to the land that it crashed in the rocks and became stuck on two reefs in turbulent surf. It began to come apart right where the treasure hunters had found what they believed to be the Schulenberg. Let's go down. Because the slaves abroad were valuable cargo, the crew and captain tried to save them. Some were sent to shore in a barge, according to the testimony, but the strong surf prevented the barge from returning to the ship to pick up more slaves. Hours passed. You can see the sisters standing at the old port, a building on Mozambique Island just off of Mozambique in East Africa where slaves were housed. Um. Those abroad made ropes and baskets 
the testimony said according to an English translation and continuing like this, were able to save some men and slaves until five in the evening when the ship broke to pieces. But by then, only half of the slaves on board, along with all of the crew, had been rescued. Some 212 slaves died. The document refers to the crew members as men, but not the slaves. The slave owners had a vested interest in people surviving. Mr. Uh, Lubkamen said, people who were considered cargo in much of the manner today that sellers would consider livestock being transported as cargo. It's like you have a barrel of apples and you don't want them to spoil, he said. It's a horrible analogy, but that's how the owners viewed them. So you can see how they referred to them um the captain's testimony led uh researchers and in mr lebukeman's slave rex project to comb portugal's national shipping archives for information about the sao jose they have found the ship's manifest which detailed the sao jose's departure from lisbon in April 1794, bound for Mozambique Island, just off of Mozambique in East Africa, where the slave trade had expanded from the more heavily trafficked coast of West Africa. That's the expansion. It's not just West Africa giving the American slaves anymore. It's also East Africa. It's also East Africa. Let's get him. Included in the manifest was what turned out to be the most important clue in the search. The Sao Jose had left Lisbon with 1,500 iron blocks of ballast, just like an old slave ship would have to offset the balance of people moving in the ship. And there they go there. Surface saying that he had seen iron blocks buried in the ocean floor. There resting in the sand were black iron bars with holes in them. These are the iron bars. As well as parts of the ship which are now in the Washington Museum. Iron blocks of ballast recovered from the wreck of the Sao Jose. A Portuguese slave ship on which they were used to offset the weight of the human cargo. Ezekiel Museums. Hmm. Huh. What did he say? He said he understood instantly what they were. Ballast, iron blocks of ballast. I'm a scientist. I'm not one for massive amounts of emotion, Mr. Boshoff said. But he added, I knew immediately. Iron ballast bars were part of the currency of the slave trade. Ships undergoing those long ocean voyages needed weight to keep them stable. And human beings in the cargo hold do not weigh enough. Huh? New York Times. <laughs> I'm not going to. That's enough. That's enough for there. I could go into the DNA of the people over there. <laughs> we don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. Good work, David Basil. Remember this book right here. Black Mother. What chapter is it? When you pipe at Zanzibar. What did it say? What did it say is right there. About half of these went northward to Arabia, the Persian Gulf, and Egypt. Most of the rest were smuggled southward to the Portuguese in Mozambique, who sent them to Brazil. American slave ships also drew cargoes from this source. After 1840, the business of extracting slaves from East Africa became a major Arab enterprise. We Stop. Stop. There go my brother Pan African James and the Jason Edwards Hitep Saber. Hitep M Hotep Ma Akeru. My brother Smash Rockwell. The arrows is we hitting them with. Bah, bah, bah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's over. It's over. Let, let me, where's my link at? I'm going to drop a link just in case. Just in case y'all want to come in. 
It's over. Let me drop this in the chat for y'all. It's over, man. It's over. And so... The jig is up. No, let me stop. Uh, it's anybody who doesn't know East Africa's involvement in the transatlantic slave trade. You can talk about the slave trade, but what I need you to do before you start running off at the mouth. Do the full research. And I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm done with telling you all about it. Unless something comes up. But if you claim that it's not there. Or that. You're not Egyptian. You're not East. You don't know anything about. You don't know what you're talking about. You're pseudo. You're pseudo. And when you get to that point. You need to slow yourself down. You need to bring it down a tad. And you need to remember. This is an African Holocaust. It covered the entire continent. The whole thing, not just parts of it. It said that it said in that article the Arabs had pushed halfway into the interior of the continent. That's a long way when you're talking about African bodies. They pushed, think about Arabia, think about Palestine. Think about the Arab dynasty in Arabia. They pushed halfway into the continent. Remember, they've already established Timbuktu slave and trade routes. They already had that established in ancient Egypt times to Roman times. You've seen the gentlemen start to re... Re... Ostracize. That's not... He started to reopen up the old trade routes. The Sultan did, right? My brother, my brother said Abraham Samuel on Wikipedia uh, had slating trade routes to Madagascar to New York. Exactly. 1600 to 1700. Easy. Easy. My, my brother Rob Bourne already know. He said, me and Smash is a dream team. Me and Smash get busy, man. We get busy. And that was an accidental connection just off of something that was related. <laughs> my brother Smash. My brother Smash be putting it down, man. He, and, and, and what I like about Smash is after you do your work, after or when he's doing your work, his work, you have to go do your work in order to even add to what he has because he covers it so thoroughly and so then he make me go i gotta go into a whole nother language just to put something more in there with it i gotta go into a whole nother language but let's not be fooled here um go share the video anybody who's talking crazy you got three videos full of evidence and this is not watch. I'm a, I'm, let me show you a book. Let me show you a book real quick. This is a book my brother Rob Bourne knows about because I showed it to him a long time ago. Me and him was having a discussion with some Hebrew cats. Uh, let me take you all to a place y'all can get it easy. Let's go to sacred text real quick. Sacred text. This is a this is a book from uh, put together. If anybody has this book, it's going to debunk most of what they're talking about <laughs> because it's what they're looking for is the belief issue. They have the issue with the belief. Now we covered that on video one, and we found the SARS on the boat. Video one. It was all. It was already done. But this is not, like I said, this is not aimed at my brother Rob Bourne anymore. I heard some okie doke cat just this morning talking crazy. And uh uh-uh. That's that's a no-go. 
That's a no-go. Talking about we should be worried more about the veterans than what happened in the African Holocaust and trying to get reparations. If anything, dummy, that would help the veterans because several Africans fought in the war that you didn't take care of. Everybody else got taken care of. You left them out. So we should definitely be fighting for reparations. Anyway, you click a place called Africa over in this column here to my left. And then you go down. You should really get all these books. These are pretty good. This book here is called Drums and Shadows. Let me go back to the description real quick. Coastal Georgia folklore from the 1930s and connections to African spiritual practices. Mary Granger, Supervisor, Georgia Ritter's Project. You see the sister here? Go into the stories here because when you do, old four. If you're a, if you're a Gullah Geechee, this is a book for you. Um, if you're from Jamaica, this is a book for you. And what they do is they they tell you when to read the four because they say we keep the language that they spoke in and we try to put it in there as they would have spoken it as a respect to keeping the colloquial frame, not a disrespect concerning their linguistics. We just wanted to keep it. And so it's going to talk to you and you can probably hear a, a grandma at that time who wasn't so familiar with English because she spoke a different language, right? Years ago, she sighed, I have a husband would treat me well. Our uh was living good. So they talk like that. But as you read it, you're going to hear someone in the South. You're going to hear what's going on. You're going to hear them say there's spirits in this. There's spirits. Look, and spirits and all. There's witches. Why the why days are old? Uh huh. Nah, yeah, what people say is which what rides, folks. We all leave alone. We live alone. We shut the dough, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. They're gonna go into it. Go get the book, it's free. Go download it now. <laughs> download it now. What is it called? Drums and Shadows. And it's going to tell you about the ports that the different Africans came through and what they thought spiritually. Because when you first get to the Americas, there are no African Christians, really. The one that is an African Christian, which I covered in the rap battle. My, shout out to my man, Jake, for taking the battle. I gave in the last verse of my rhyme because they're Hebrew Israelites. I give him a history lesson and I start with that first Christian who was an African Greek mix who was baptizing people. Then I go to the next one down. Then I go to the one after that who ends up in the book of Negroes, blah, 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 etc. I give you a whole history in that last verse. And it was on my old computer, which is stolen. But if you get with Lex Vortex and tell him, show me the battle you had with Bump Chill, the song Ka, he'll show it to you and you can listen to that verse and you can get the names out of that verse and you can go do some research because it's going to tell you the history in that verse. And the verse was dope. And they said I 30 them. But of course, the judges were his rap crew. So it is what it is. It means nothing. <laughs> I'm just telling you about the pieces of history so you can start to put this together let me stop sharing no one popped in that means you guys are good any questions i'm looking in the chat now thank you brother brother james you know <laughs> he said where rob <laughs> my brother ryan gotta answer me i already told him you can't really answer this you can't which is why when they're saying this and that, I just tell them, stop. You don't know what you're talking about. 
You don't know what you're talking about. Me and him always play around. He did discredit the finding of the names of Saul. He thought he did. He thought he did. <laughs> no, see, this is an assault from over here. This is an assault from over here. Shout out to Danny, because Danny went to school with us out here in Colorado. For those of y'all who don't know, Dan <laughs> Danny, Danny was at manual with me when I would get kicked out all the time for fighting or something crazy. Um, he's back in Brooklyn now. Um, so them, that's family. None of that's, you know. But anybody telling you this gibberish, you have all the sources here. If you get on an on a panel and they invite you on to discuss this, and you start pulling up the, it's gonna get real quiet. Then, man, you always doing it. You gonna get something like that. Then they're gonna be mad at you. Then you're gonna get kicked off. But it's one on one. I've been talking forever. E T E M Hatep Sini Sinet. Remember who you are. Who is a saw? Why do I say that? A saw represents the ancestor cult in ancient Africa. You are your ancestors. Professor Smalls told us that, right? So did a saw. So did the ancestors. So I said, remember who you are and be an Asar. Uncle Jasenev, life, strength, health. I'll be on one of your channels in a few minutes, holla. 